the voices used to tell her that you know if two of your children have died why is this alive mm-hmm. you can go on humiliating me but i will just stay calm and i will do my work i have cried myself horse uh you know banging my head on the wall and cried i have gone through it so much that i know that in the end nothing happens and if you're crying and if you're sad nobody wants you we have one uh, athlete on wheelchair who does a 240 kg bench press they are better than the normal when you are able to adjust yourself and make yourself so strong that i can live without anything you know and i can always start from scratch and then grow that faith keeps you alive i'm sharing it with you nobody else knows about it so i'm sharing this for the first time here dr rita jairat your story is one of the most inspiring stories that i have come across in the recent uh, in the past and um, i want to start off this conversation by talking about your childhood and especially you had a schizophrenic mom how was growing up uh, like for you uh well in those times uh, people did not have a kind of awareness about how specific mental disorders are and uh, there was just a kind of a line black and white so either you are mad and insane or not so there's nothing in between uh, although these these are all spectrums we talk about it now and so we were socially very isolated and uh, it goes without saying that she was obviously not in a condition to uh, give love and affection or take care of us or cook and how the you know the rest of the mothers usually do uh, so uh, i was kind of god's child and uh, been brought up by uh my father primarily but when he was busy and he he had office work to do he had a lot on him uh so it was neighbors sometimes uh you know we would go to and they'd give us food and it was somehow i'm i'm like in the truest sense of the word uh, god's child uh so she used to get auditory hallucinations and uh you know those voices used to uh trouble her a lot she used to be very upset and uh uh because the repercussions of that was that my father used to be very upset mm. and so uh you know uh, there was i was kind of the punching bag uh and very fragile at home so i have been through a lot of beatings beaten up blue and black uh, for very very minor petty irrelevant reasons so most of my childhood passed like that mm-hmm. and yes in my quest to uh, you know receive love and affection and also acceptance in the rest of the society um it has been my endeavor to do well uh fortunately and just how uh, you know those times where we didn't have things like social media or uh, in the internet and stuff like that to distract us uh i had a simple life so we were into reading books and when you are alone uh, you are uh, you know very at a very early age uh, in a journey of self actualization because mm-hmm. that's what that's all you have to lean back on mm-hmm. uh, so i always used to strive to get as perfect in whatever i do pursue a lot of hobbies um, you know explore myself so that i can relate to uh such communities uh, get recognition and acceptance and then receive all the love that i might i would might have been craving for at that point of time mm. and uh, i think you had two siblings before you who couldn't yes. survive right yes yes so i had uh, uh, a sister uh, she died she was the eldest and then a brother uh, so they died very young my brother died uh, as you know he was still born because uh, my mother did not get medical attention at that time and uh, that impacted her so much that uh, she lost her mental balance and uh, she used to somehow feel that it would be difficult uh, for uh, you know the next child to survive and it just added up too much and um, she used to the voices used to tell her that you know if two of your children have died why is this alive mm-hmm. uh and um, she started getting these hallucinations when she was carrying me so uh it might have been even difficult for me to uh, be born normal 
and uh, uh, you know survive also so uh, again i said i'm god's child mm-hmm. you mentioned about you know the craving for the love mm-hmm. at home mm-hmm. uh, because being beaten and mm-hmm. uh, that always you know i always feel that mm-hmm. when you grow up with such a difficult condition at home where you're like always beaten up you seek that love you seek that validation you seek that affection um and uh, you know uh, to a larger extent that sort of manifests in you know ways you yes. can't even fathom when you grow up right mm. so how has your definition of love evolved uh, you know over the years from that upbringing yeah so uh, that upbringing was probably not the only thing um, um because we were living in isolation and uh, uh, you know all relatives left us most of my relatives are abroad and you know then they they actually cut off uh, so uh, again i was very isolated and uh, it was my dream to get married in a family where i would receive a lot of love uh of course from my husband because that my my age was such i was very young and then you know the uh, love and affection of a mother from my uh, mother in law and my father in law so i uh, had that childish desire in me and uh, uh because i had not interacted in in society and amongst relatives like uh, the children from joint families are very smart they know the dynamics of how relatives and things uh, such things work i just thought that it uh, i was like i thought it's a fairy land and uh, my expectations were probably too high uh but unfortunately once i got married uh you know their uh, expectations uh, were of uh, you know a very typical daughter in law that you know i would get probably a lot of dowry and uh, i would be, i could easily be enslaved uh one of the conditions uh on which i got married was that i would be allowed to study further mm-hmm. and uh, my husband was in merchant navy and uh, uh, they told me that he will be staying uh, on the ship all the time and i wanted to pursue uh, mbbs and i wanted to be a doctor i mean that was even till now when i think of it i skip a heartbeat uh, so i wanted to do that and uh, i thought i would be studying for my entrance exam because that's how it was in those times um, but the moment i would sit with a book you know you know they would be very upset and they would cry and they would hide my books and you know all those it was it used to just get very melodramatic and uh, i was overburdened with a lot of household work and drudgery um, unimaginably so and uh, so you know um, they probably took it as a weakness that mm. uh because she has nobody back home and uh, you know there are no relatives and she is all by herself she cannot go back to that environment uh so we can just bully her and she has no choice but to uh you know bear it and then time passed and i got no medical attention and uh, uh i was very sick i i wasn't even getting proper nutrition uh i was sleeping for 2 3 hours and i was just working non stop uh it was a joint family of 8 9 people and uh i was the only wo- one doing all the work and they would get drunk at night and uh you know right from cleaning the utensils to mopping the floor and everything you know with the hand and washing the clothes i mean there was no uh you know no washing machine or something like that i was doing everything on my own so you know you can take it to think it to the extreme i lost a lot of weight i was very sick and then uh my son was born and uh, of course again during my when he was born it was uh, difficult for them to convince uh, them to get, give me enough medical attention uh, but then he was born very beautiful child uh, but then eventually he was diagnosed uh, autistic mm. and uh, all my hopes and dreams were on him on my child like him or her whoever it would be that once i have a child i i would have somebody would be my own and uh, maybe you know uh, in that age of course i used to think it in my control mm. uh, that you know i would nurture uh, him or her the way i want and i would probably receive all the love and affection and do the things which i missed out in life but uh, then you know with the autism obviously i broke down and 
I had decided at that point of time, like all doors were closed for me. He was all I had. Mm -hmm. And I said that since I have actually lost every hope and desire, uh, I will give my 100% to this child. Uh, autism was not known mm -hmm. until 1991 in India. It came in the psychiatry books in 91. And he's an 88 born child. So everybody said that maybe because her mother is mad, he is mad, and she doesn't know how to bring up a child. And the fault was entirely mine. So, uh, you know, I got further isolated. Uh, but then I was really bent upon uh, understanding his problems. And uh, I went to certain doctors. And it was at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences that one of the doctors told me to explore this uh, autism and ask someone... Uh, if I knew someone from US, uh, I have my uncle there, my maternal uncle there, and he sent me this literature, and I realized that he has exactly the same symptoms. Mm -hmm. So that's how, and they said that he would be, uh, you know, non, uh, he would not be able to speak, uh, but he didn't have an articulation problem. So they said, even if you try, it takes about 20, 25 years of you know, giving 24 hours, if not 36 hours in every 24 hours. Like it needs you to, you to leave everything and just uh, focus on this one thing. Nobody does that. Mm -hmm. You can do it for one year, two years, but not like 20 odd years. But that since I didn't have anything else, uh, you know, to look forward to. So I just decided that let me do something which nobody has done until now. And so was that because you were craving that attention and love, mm -hmm. you know, as a kid that you wanted like, okay, I want to give all my love attention and shower this kid with mm -hmm. everything that he needs. To some extent, yes. But to some extent that I had a kind of a tiff with God that why everything else has been closed for me, I want to fight it out. Mm. If you have not even given an instinct to my child, let me try to, you know, conquer that. Uh, let me, because doctors said that there can be a possibility if you give 20 years. And I said, if there is a human possibility, even the remotest one, I must give it a try. Mm. Uh, let me do something which nobody has done until now and set an example for the parents of all autistic children or all children or parents who have children with special needs, uh, you know, that there is a possibility. It will give them hope. I want to set an example and do something uh, which is unique so that I stand out. Mm. So that was one of the very uh, first things which I took up, which where there was no uh, possibility of happening, uh, you know, of uh, actually becoming real that I took up. And uh, he started talking, uh, you know, within uh, one year. Like he was almost two and a half years when he said his first word. So uh, then, then you know, I became a little hopeful. Mm -hmm. And I think word by word I taught him. I went to so many psychiatrists and uh, counselors and I, you know, followed what the th kind of therapies they were having for uh, spastic children or dyslexic children. Uh, because all that was known and documented uh, mm. in books and all that. But I started picking up uh, ways of treating such children and then converting them into uh, kind of therapeutic modalities mm. which will suit my son's specific need. So there is no better psychiatrist than a mother because the mother knows, you know, very extremely uh, finer intricacies and nuances about that child. Mm. And if a mother is bent upon doing it, then, you know, uh, she will do it. So, you know, even when I uh, got him admitted in a school, at that time, nobody uh, believed that he can be in a normal school, but I, I was bent upon it. So I used to go to school with him. I rewrote all the NCRT books. And until his 10th standard, everybody thought that, why is she doing this? Like, I used to be just you know, uh, making him learn answers, taking him out with me, trying to uh, engage him in so many activities uh, so that, you know, the brain gets stimulation. Did that frustrate you at some point? 
it used to hurt me a lot but uh, i knew that this is for the long haul and uh, i had nothing else to look forward to and this was something which i had taken up and uh, my childhood had been very bad and it had always my, been my dream even when i was very small i used to think that when i have children i will have normal children and i will love them and i will do this and that i want and my children will be uh, very glorious because uh, i was you know from a very tender age as i said maybe to receive love or whatever i was very fond of doing a lot of things uh, you know uh, exploring my potential at that time i was in putting this in words but i was doing it mm. even as a child i never had any indulgences like children do you know getting into wrong uh, paths pathways and i was never like that i always wanted to do i was a maybe bit idealistic maybe too idealistic but i always wanted to do something nice and grow and evolve uh, even as a child but does i does that come from uh, does that come from the need to prove to your uh, you know mother to some extent or maybe crave for love or seeking that validation or maybe from the dedication that you have seen in your father uh, because you know one of the things that your dad did was took care of your you know mother for 35 years yes. and i think that is a lot of commitment a man can show absolutely absolutely a mix of both uh, i probably didn't expect much love from my mother because she was really not in her senses but yes a validation and acceptance more of it from my father i wanted to, i always wanted to please him and uh, he was like a friend and a brother and everything like uh, Uh, till the time he died i never felt the need of uh, you know having any friends even girlfriends i never had a friend i was all uh, always by myself mm. uh for a very long time and uh, so you know i always had this uh, craving in me to be to do a lot of uh, things like bharatnatyam even as a child i learned bharatnatyam for about 10 years i was into music uh, all my school friends who are now in touch with me they tell me to uh it they, they they talk to me about those days uh when i used to sing in the class participate in lot of competitions into school and stuff like that i was school leader in my uh, school when i passed out from kendriya vidyalaya so i i was always into uh, many activities but i felt that i wasn't getting the kind of encouragement and support that could help me to reach uh you know my peak and i wanted to do that uh, for my child somewhere around the line i think that uh, my father wasn't able to give me the 100% because he was too engaged with my mother you know in in her therapy he was also insecure because he was all by himself he was aging and you know he, with two daughters he was also uh, very concerned and you know there's a kind of fear so uh, all these desires were there in me and so maybe that is why i had pursued this that i wanted to do something unique because mm -hmm. now i had nothing else to look forward to so i just wanted to give my 100% that i would do something which nobody has done uh and a uh, lot of doctors told me that uh, autistic children uh, they tend to have cerebral hypoplasia so cerebellum is responsible for balance mm -hmm. and uh, they told me that you can teach him balancing activities so that's how i got into skating and swimming so i and him like mother and child we would go and learn together train together and uh, people would find it very awkward because you know early 90s many years ago that was a time when uh, i don't know people whether people can relate to that now or not but really i mean like a, a grown up woman a mother Uh, doing it at all these things at that time was considered very very uh, weird unheard of yeah yes very weird so i would stand out like that all the time some people would like it some people would make fun of it but nobody ignored it you know mm. it just always come in like what did you tell it. yourself because i was doing it for myself i had at a very early age because my mother used to you know talk to the hallucination scream uh take off her clothes do was very violent you know to what to the, whatever you can imagine so i had somehow uh, subconsciously learned to ignore what people around me are saying or doing 
I would always do my own thing. So uh, I think it didn't affect me, neither positively nor negatively. Like I am my own person. So uh, it is just didn't affect me. I was just doing what I want. As long as uh, that's how, you know, when I got into bodybuilding, like I said, as long as I am not doing anything illegal or immoral or anything, nobody can stop me. You know? mm. Mm. So I was just doing my own thing. Yeah. So, you know, once you have, you've like, challenges at your home with your mother's illness and then you got married and then you had a child um, you know who was not what you expected again another challenge in you know in that way um, and then um, you know then having a tough family as well um, you know to when, when you were married yeah. your husband's side of things um, and then talk about your marriage as well and uh, you know was there a challenge what what was that the another challenge that you went through yeah because he was in merchant navy so as it is he was alone most of the time mm -hmm. I, I was alone most of the time he was away on the ship and uh, my in-laws they probably didn't want us to be very connected uh, they felt that he would not be in their control they wanted control over his salary they wanted him to settle them down and buy them a house, get the brothers married. So they, they felt a bit uh, worried that if he gets close to me, then he may not do it. Probably their own insecurities, fears, and uh, the kind of background they are from. Um, they, they are very, very, uh, I don't know, I don't want to use the word, but, they, but greedy, you know, I mean, like, very money-minded. So uh, that because of that, they kind of kept him very distracted from me. He has his, he had his own world, and uh, you know that magnified because my attention was with my son, and he had his own uh, world of friends, and uh, he liked to party, he liked to drink, he liked to you know have fun, and he was completely opposite of how I am. I have never had a sip of alcohol in my life. And I have never had the desire to go into these pubs and stuff like that. But he was just into that. So we were like kind of extremes. So he was in his own world and uh, he thought I'm pretty boring. So <laughs> um, he was away most of the times. And uh, yeah, on the ship again, he had his own, uh, you know, there are women they meet and he had his friends. So he was more uh, happier with them probably. So I was very lonely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he, after a kind of uh, gap, you know, now he's uh, come back. He has Parkinson's disease, and uh, he needs my help now. Obviously, he's very sick. So I just thought that it is probably now uh, because he's the father of my son, and uh, it is my duty to look after him no matter what. You know. Um, we all have to go away one day. I think we should just do the best and, or, you know, whatever we can. So that's about, about him. And do you think when you come from a lot of um, struggle and when you are faced with a lot of challenges, um, you know, you pour love naturally because one of the things that I have noticed is all you have to offer is love and kindness to people. Yes, I think uh, I have been through so much of humiliation and uh, people who knew that I am, I have no choice but to do this or that, you know, whether it's profession or people know my background, you know, uh, they know that I'm alone, uh, even say in my neighborhood, People knew she's all alone. So everybody has tried, you know, all sort of tactics to maybe bully me or suppress me. I have kind of learned the art of maneuvering through that, you know, moving through that, that they will suppress me, they will trouble me, let them do their karma, but I will keep going. I endure a lot hell of a lot but there is there will always be one point where i don't break and uh, 
the kind of endurance that I have developed for humiliation is that you can go on humiliating me, but I will just stay calm and I will do my work. That art, I think, that is one of the things I have mastered in my life. And, uh, uh, you know, because I cannot talk about the exact profession and the exact people here because I'm, I am involved professionally. But then uh, say there is a, say bodybuilding, you know, let me talk about the past. Everybody criticized me. How can a woman be a bodybuilder? How can you take off your clothes and go on stage but thousand people are judging you? And I said, yes, it's all wrong. It's very bad. I'm a bad woman. I won't fight with them. I won't quarrel with them. But I would silently keep on doing. You can stop me for exercise, from doing exercise in the gym. But uh, there is a ground. There is a, your whole body is there. Uh, I mean, like, if you tell me here, I can do a push-up on this table. I can do a push-up on the floor. You cannot stop a person. If the person is determined to do something which is not immoral, unethical or illegal. You cannot stop. If the person has that fire, that person will do it. If there are villages, you know, in the, uh, you know, who have nothing to eat, they don't have shoes, but they have won Olympic medals, we're still better off. You know, we can, we have education, we have a whole world of uh, teachings from, right from Sanskrit shlokas to Kabir Dohas to help us you know, cruise through that. So <clears throat> people have, that, that the humiliation that I have learned to bear has taught me one thing. I will never do it back to anybody. I know exactly how it feels when somebody tries to hurt you. So I don't do it back. And uh, another thing that I have learned is that uh, no matter what I want to tell you, suppose I want to tell you something which is very, very harsh, I can say it, I can still say it in the kindest way. The firmness has to be inside my heart and soul. The firmness doesn't have to come out in the form of aggression. If it is coming out in the form of aggression, it means I have lost my self-control. That means I need to work on my, my soul because I am not controlled and contained. So that balance, you know, that to build that equilibrium in the mind, I think that helps us to place our emotions correctly. And uh, yes, as you said that uh, I have craved for love all my life. So I, all I have to offer is only love. Absolutely. You know, you mentioned that you were into Bharatanatyam and uh, you know that dance form is often uh, you know is it's the expression of the stories and emotion in, in mm -hmm. that dance form right mm -hmm. um, to some extent have you also felt that that has been your way of pouring uh, your emotions and stories in that dance form in some some you know some way yes of course i think the primary element of bharatanatyam is abhinaya uh, so i had a guru who used to tell me, uh, who you, you know, we had, a, we were a group of students and uh, this is interesting. So uh, she used to tell uh, everybody to do, uh, you know, give, say, give, she would give them a sentence and tell them to say it uh, with an expression, uh, you know, from the Navrasa. You, you know the and you know the nine kind of expressions we have and she though she would assign everybody the expression which for that particular person would be a challenge so she used to always give me uh, tell me to express that with anger because it is so difficult to make me angry uh, so you know when it comes yes in Bharatanatyam when it comes to love laugh uh, smile, uh, no, every other thing, it would come to me very easy. But uh, when it comes to expression of anger or violence, it becomes a bit difficult for me. And uh, I think the same thing manifests in weight training. You know, that's kind of, um, it carries down there because I feel uh, when, a, when I would be shooting for a, say, a weight training thing, uh, the photographer would tell me, bring aggression on your face. And I couldn't. 
because I felt that all the strength I have to apply, say if I'm lifting a dumbbell, I have to apply the strength here. Why would I be, you know, clenching my face? So you have to know to how to place your expression correctly. There is a kind of strength in stillness. Uh, the greatest strength is in being calm and being still. Uh, if you say that is not only emotionally, but even physically. Suppose we call it an isometric hold. Suppose you are holding your hand like that for five minutes. It's probably very painful and much more difficult than moving it and lifting something heavy. So you, you need to know how to place, uh, you know, your emotions, your strength. And if a person is actually getting angry, that means the person is very fragile inside. That person is not strong. Aggression is a symptom of weakness. So my father used to say, if someone is angry, then love him very much, eat food. That person is weak. That person has not mastered self-control. Mm -hmm. So, yes, um, another thing is that uh, there are moments when I have felt like, uh, felt sad, cried. I have cried myself hoarse, uh, you know, banging my head on the wall and cried. I have gone through it so much that I know that in the end nothing happens. And if you're crying and if you're sad, nobody wants you. So, uh, having done that and conquered that, I have come to a stage that if I am uh, sad, I know how to smile a little extra so that I can conquer that feeling. So, uh, I mean, I'm not doing that now, but I'm just telling you, <laughs> I'm sharing that with you, that these are life skills and they really help you. So uh, that's how it has been that uh, I have been able to keep myself strong uh, through these years and uh, because I had no choice. Uh, so when you push to the edge, then, you know, that is when you learn and you go way beyond what other people would generally do, you know, what a reflex action would make you do. Mm. So your achievements in the bodybuilding mm -hmm. is a long, long list of accomplishments. <laughs> um, you started bodybuilding as a way or rather going to gym as a way to start training your son. Yes. and start helping yeah. him pick up you know weights and build the strength yes. and then you yourself went on to you know yes. bodybuilding and professionally so yeah. how old were you uh professionally i started when i was 37 yeah. wow mm. and did you not feel that oh am i too old to do this or you know uh, or maybe I'm sure people around you must have said things like that. Yes, uh, people Plus said Plus being that. a woman and it was, oh, yes. uh, we are talking about 1990s. Yes, or, you yeah, see. Late 90s, yeah. Yeah, the thing is that, uh, as I said, that I had already gone beyond what people around me mm -hmm. say. And uh, as far as being old is concerned, that time passed so quickly and I was so involved with my own self. Uh, you know, that I, I kind of put this aside that I'm, um, you know, my chronological age is growing. And, uh, uh, you know, by God's grace, because I was, I have always been into some of the other physical activity and uh, or even the contradiction in the kind of physical activities, which kind of completes me, you know, and rounds me off. And also that uh, I don't have any indulgences. I think the, all these things put together have just, uh, you know, let me go, uh, you know, away from that chronological number. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So when I got into bodybuilding, yes, uh, everybody, made, yeah, a lot of people made fun of me and uh, people would tease me, people would criticize me, people would look at me, look upon me at something that, you know, uh, I mean, obviously a woman taking off clothes and going on stage was not acceptable. Uh, things have changed now. I'm so glad that, you know, we, I have been... Uh, kind of instrumental in bringing about this change in a very large way. And uh, so there was no bodybuilding competition here. All the competitions were abroad. So I went to many countries. And because everybody was, you know, uh, so much against me that you shouldn't be doing that, I was even more determined. Because after my son, this was the another thing which I took up as a first. Uh, you know, when I started uh, battling autism, uh, that the way I did it was probably one of the first. 
and then uh, now that i got into bodybuilding again you know that was that was because i have wanted to do so much in life and now i found something which i could do uh, where i kind of didn't have competition so i was traveling abroad and competing with women who are doing it anyways uh, so if i go to say czechoslovakia or madrid or uh, usa or hong kong nobody cares whether you're a man or a woman you're doing it everybody else is doing it so the atmosphere there uh, you know was such that and they would say that oh we have a woman from india i mean that's great i mean that's unbelievable because how india is looked upon you know so i mean was looked upon at that time so that all these things they help me Mm. Mm. and i think you have been very very instrumental in you know this f- you know uh this sport yes yeah, yeah. so in india and uh, i was going through your instagram and i was you know looking at the comments and i could see a lot of other women bodybuilder sort of you know leaving the comments i just you know went on to check uh, the profile and stuff like that and you know yeah. uh and that made me think that you know nobody was doing it before and here is somebody who yeah. did it and uh, and who had the most of her accom- accomplishments yeah. in 40s like yes. most of the awards yeah. and i was looking at like okay 2010 11 12 yeah. and that was the time when you were you know bringing awards and yes. you know uh, winning winning gold and silver and yeah. you know and and so on and so forth and i calculated the number i'm like oh she was you know in her 40s <sighs> uh and then looking at a lot of other women uh-huh. taking this up i think that is what i feel was something uh you know like you said is a big contribution in yes. making other women believe that hey this is possible for you yeah the, you know it is the best thing about bodybuilding is that now i am uh, the only woman in the international judging panel um in ifbb in asia so uh all the girls out there all of them you know it is so gratifying that they love me mm-hmm. we talk about women you know with you know cat fights and claws out against each other but this is uh, something which i feel that all the women out there love me that means the world to me because no matter who the competitor is you know they all they say the okay uh, rita ma'am judging panel pe hai to sab theek hai i mean they feel you know a lot of love for me i think that is one of my greatest achievement that i i have real love from real people uh, my instagram is not uh, you know those kind of numbers with millions and stuff like that uh, i think everybody uh, out there relates to me personally so that is very very gratifying mm-hmm. yeah so you know the other thing that i wanted to sort of you know discuss with you is after all of this uh so what is your relationship with your son is like right now and you know you uh-huh. mentioned the dedication that you have and the time and effort that you have put in yeah. in uh you know in spending time teaching him stuff yeah. and uh you know now what is he doing and how has his transformation uh or how has his life shaped up Oh, he is my greatest teacher mm-hmm. because he has helped me to evolve my soul. He has he is the one who introduced me to bodybuilding. Uh it is for him that I wanted to stay strong. And uh now that uh, you know he did his graduation and post graduation from UK, everybody thought I am mad because I'm spending all that money, but you know I wanted him to get enriched. And as I said, I have always been determined through these decades uh that you know he should do well and he should be an example for the world and now it it does happen that hundreds of pa- uh, parents they call me sometimes at night and they say how do you how did you do this it, it seems impossible and you know my child is getting aggressive and so i always uh try to uh, calm down mothers and talk to them uh now he is working with the hotel lalit uh they have a quota for uh you know people with intellectual disabilities and i think that is amazing that is amazing work i always felt that uh, there was always a job availability for physically handicapped people but nothing because the physically handicapped person you know per se person on a wheelchair can think for himself or herself they can they can still do work they have some provision for every kind of handicap they may have a translator they may have a reader they, you know something is there 
but for a person who is mentally challenged cannot think for you know that person just to make that person functional it is it is just you know it's a huge massive task it takes away all your mental energy and your resilience you need to really change yourself from deep within that takes hell of a lot so you know he had tried to do a job in a couple of places and it didn't work out but here uh the the atmosphere they have given him is so good they have helped him to adjust they have adjusted with him uh they they pamper him like a child and then they make him do a lot of work so he does a 10 hour duty and of course his salary is very minimal but it's not that and as i told you i mean he's kind of getting paid therapy uh it gives a lot of solace to my heart because i used to wonder what will happen to him when i go but i think i'm sure in the next few years he'll be very settled uh, with a job and you know being functional looking after people at the front desk mm -hmm. uh you know dealing with people who are you know international guests mm -hmm. dealing with them talking to them calming down i think it's huge i think there's massive work that they're doing and they've set an example for other organizations also uh to employ such people that is massive uh so i and me uh, my son we are best friends it's because of him i got into he is a very good singer mm -hmm. so all autistic people have some special talent so he sings very well exceedingly well uh so i got him introduced to classical music mm -hmm. and then we started learning together so we are i tease him sometimes that i'm your younger sister uh in you know so many ways because he you are my teacher <laughs> so uh one of the things that uh i wanted to do after bodybuilding is once i retire you know when i was uh, competing i had those six packs and i was very muscular wherever i would walk people would look back and you know all that attention and stuff like that you are special you are unique uh i think every girl uh, in any uh, sport whether it's bodybuilding or athletics or whatever they need to know how to retire gracefully come out of it and then still keep yourself strong i never did bodybuilding for the medal i did bodybuilding because i wanted to do it for the cause of it for the love of it and uh, how to you know to explore your potentials what all has uh, you know god showered you with from within if you have just lived your life without exploring yourself and you say oh i want to live my life so you just go to a disco or bar and have drinks because you're living your life then you, you are you know really on the wrong track i mean you have so you have a world in you you know you can just do anything uh so today in fact just today uh, uh at the sports authority of india you know i was offered to train for this world championship where uh, women in you know about 50s and masters uh, can you know uh, be into athletics a 100 meter 100 meter race now you're uh, running that's a new thing running i mean like so there's something my, that's my new uh, thing and this is just uh, i'm sharing it with you nobody else knows about it so i'm sharing this for the first time here and uh, yes training para uh, athletes uh, you know uh, those athletes on wheelchair they're phenomenal we have one Uh, athlete on wheelchair who does a 240 kg bench press they are better than the normal wow. because god kind of super compensates uh, when god takes away something from you so uh, these are all very gratifying experiences mm. when i look at your life it looks like you have mastered how to when when situation or god throws challenges at you mm -hmm. and then take that gracefully and then make something beautiful out of it oh yeah, yeah. um so for anyone who's listening to this and maybe going through some sort of challenging phase in the life right now mm -hmm. um or you know or maybe somebody who is in the space where like you know in your case there has been several dead ends yes. you know whether that's uh you know having a son with a problem or having you know challenge in your uh marriage and so on and so forth there has been so many challenges in your life right so what is your sort of way of navigating through this from the mental uh, you know perspective of course the challenge can be anything but i'm sure there is a sort of a you know certain mental uh, model per se or the yeah. thought process that you go through to yes. sort of say that okay here's the challenge uh, how do you go about it we don't attach ourselves and think too much on things that you cannot control uh 
we need to have a parallel sense of detachment with the result so we must accept we really have no choice when you have no control over something then you know you just leave it on god jo hoga dekha jayega surrender worst case scenario what will happen let me make myself so powerful mentally that even in the worst situation i will kind of live through it and accept it gracefully you know if you can do that then first of all you will become fearless the second thing is that uh you need to understand that there is a process analogous in every field it's the same process of learning unlearning relearning and just like my son was told that he will never be able to speak but i broke the entire thing into micro steps and irrespective of the time it would take to even say a syllable i made sure that i i stopped attaching myself to the time factor so today even if i go to learn a new art i i did learn kalari bhat for some time i started i restarted bharatnatyam after gap of 25 years and i had completely forgotten so no matter what you pursue you can do anything if you break it into micro micro steps and don't worry about the time you have to have so much humility that you need to understand that except for your very own field you are a layman everywhere and if you go to a new field you know that i am here for the long haul there will be people who will be very good they will come they will go they will come they will go but you will be there and it is impossible that over a long period of time you will not be able to do what you want to do or what you want to achieve so this is the analogy which i have applied in my life that's why you give me any field any subject anything i will go and master it i just have learned that flexibility in the mind and the process of acceptance and the humility that i am a learner forever and the second thing is that when there is a so when there is a challenge and when there is a dead end one must be able to accept uh, and surrender you need to surrender before god that if it is if it is bound if it is destined to be this then this is how it shall be then start from zero and fight for it some time ago i was in a very difficult situation i uh, you know financially uh, i was having a, i had a setback i started you know commuting by metro i looked for a job i'm still having that job and i'm doing all the other things and then i revived you know you then now i am much more stronger because i know that even if that situation comes i can get any job i can trust you know i can learn anything so it kind of further reinforces you that belief in yourself comes when you when you are ready to be humble why why we are scared is oh i have a bungalow i have a ac i have this car i will lose this that that it is the fear when you are able to adjust yourself and make yourself so strong that i can live without anything you know and i can always start from scratch and then grow that faith keeps you alive you know so uh, i think these are the things uh, which keep you going and you know in the end one thing i still worry about is what what will happen to my son mm. when i'm not there i'm working on it day mm. and night i have worked on it for 35 years now he will be 35 in november but there is one thing which is which we people dread but it is the most beautiful thing and that is the idea of mortality we all have to die one day mm. i think that keeps you grounded that no matter how rich you are how poor you are and how much in pain you are suppose the pain is unbearable there is something called death that will happen it will end one day mm. so if you are uh, start realizing all these things then you know uh, some people crave a lot for a lot of fame you must understand that once you die in some time in four days people will forget you mm. so uh, let us live this life you know to the fullest and enjoy relish every moment of it if you live with this kind of mindset nothing will bother you and what's your hope for your son after you gone uh, yeah so he's doing this job 
I am trying to train him. I all, I don't, I don't keep any money with me. I have given him all the money, and I tell him to handle it. Let him do mistakes. I tell him to handle it. So recently, he did one silly mistake. He used the credit card, and he was getting this move and pick ice cream. He got ice cream for fifty thousand, and I was like, oh my god, uh, I was upset, obviously, because I work very hard. But then I, I told him how you can do it better. And I said, doesn't matter. I will, I will pay for it. But it's good that you're doing all these blunders, serious, serious blunders now, when I'm alive. And uh, I am working on, you know, uh, making a trust. Uh, I am working on consolidating all my savings and putting them together, you know, in such a way that he has it. But yes, uh, when I make a trust, obviously I'm going to have somebody who is going to take care of him, take care of the money. Uh, and you know all the legalities, but then I, I will not be there because if I'm there, then things will not go wrong for him at least. I will take the brunt on me. I'll take all the pressure on me. But if something happens, then you have to let go. That you know, okay, I have done whatever I can, whatever I can humanly do. I have done everything, and God has shown me the path. After that, if something happened, then okay, there is one moment when death will come. And all pain will end. Let's let it happen. Let us leave it on God. That parallel sense of detachment, surrender, and acceptance that will keep you going. It should be there. So when you are at this point of life, when you have some time <clears throat> for yourself, mm -hmm. and when you are by yourself, just looking back at your life and just the journey that you have had. Mm -hmm. What are the few things that come up for you? Oh, I say wow. <laughs> so I say <clears throat> to myself that uh, I think I, at the cost of sounding immodest, I think I'm special. I'm God's special child. Uh, as I had told you that there was uh, a film uh, called Aparajita that was being filmed, made for me, and uh, you know the screenplay has been written. It doesn't happen to everybody, you know. There is a biography that has been written and that is under consideration with Penguin Books right now. So uh, whether it goes through or not, uh, you know, there are business angle, commercial angles to it, and uh, you know all the the destiny and stuff like that. But I do feel that I am born, and I think I'm there to give a message uh, to the world. So everything I have done until now, you know, whether it is uh, bringing up my son, uh, despite the circumstances, getting into bodybuilding, uh, pursuing very contradictory uh, fields of work, whether it is Bharatnatyam or corporate work as an entrepreneur or whether I'm with the football as a safeguarding officer. I think I'm one of the first, uh, you know, women safeguarding officer with the all India football. What's Federation. safeguarding officer? What they exactly do? Uh, where we look after the well-being. Uh, that includes, uh, you know, everything from sexual exploitation to the education of children, their nutrition, uh, emotional bullying, uh, selection process, everything. You know mm. that they, they, you know, travel conditions, that their general well-being and a very positive atmosphere, so that uh, you know there is no setback emotionally, physically, mentally. And uh, uh, especially for, you know, uh, special populations there. Uh, one is uh, women, one is children. And the, you know, a very, very difficult special population is the elite athlete. Mm. Because there are athletes who come and go, they play for the sake of fun. But once you reach a certain stature, then you are sensitive. You know, you need to be playing in very elite games. And people may stop you. They may be jealous people. They may, you know, you may be under pressure. So... At the end of the day, all of them are human beings. So safeguarding is something which has uh, been taken in a very proactive way only by the All India Football Federation now. So I am uh, the first one, you know, uh, holding this uh, office wow. and doing it in such a proactive way. So I'm just, I, I'll be traveling to Nepal uh, soon for a seminar with the SAC countries. Wow, well, I'm Asian from Nepal. Football Federation. Yeah, yeah. Oh, lovely. <laughs> yeah. Oh, lovely. Huh? And I love Nepal mm. for the mountains and uh, some, my, I have an extended family there. So, uh, you know, so many things are such that I have been the first one 
are doing it. And uh, everything I've done, even the uh, supplement brand that I have started, you know, I have uh, made something which is so perfect and so pristine that uh, I have not bothered about the commercial viability also. Mm -hmm. Because I feel that uh, somebody has to make a Rolls Royce, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we can do, we can get volumes from, you know, uh, cheaper things and stuff like that where there, where there is a compromise. But because I was so much into health and fitness and uh, strength, I one of my uh, one of the things that have pushed me to stay strong and fit is that I have to be there single handedly for my son until the end of uh, at least my life, you know, till the till my last breath. I am not. I cannot. Uh, have the luxury to cry mm -hmm. i do not have the luxury to say that oh i have brought you up now you look after me i cannot say that to my son it will be me who will serve my child until the end of my life and tell him that i'm grateful that you uh, taught me so much and you gave me the satisfaction of uh, being a mother you know so i have to be grateful to him and i will continue to live through him so I express that gratitude. So I am so much, uh, you know, even physically, mentally, even spiritually into health and fitness that I feel that there has to be somebody out there who makes a brand like that, uh, that can do. And I'm sure that there is an audience. So we're talking like about Proksham. Me. Proksham, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Proksham, we have nutritional supplement. Uh, we have it for sports and uh, also the nutraceutical part for healing. Uh, recovery. So the, the first products, so the first few products I came up with was, uh, you know, recovery, heal and care. Uh, because as an athlete, you know, we undergo fatigue, uh, stress, pain, soreness, uh, wear and tear. Wear hmm. and tear is something so important in an athlete's life because an athlete has a very limited shelf life. And you may have it in your mind, but to be able to do it in practice, you need your joints to stay strong for a very long time and you cannot avoid wear and tear. Mm. So how do you heal it? How do you keep it so strong that it doesn't uh, you know, happen for a very long time? And me, after retiring from my athletic career, I pursued Bharatnatyam, which is more intense. And now uh, running, athletics, you know, the actual athletics. So, I mean, there's no end. So just the way... Uh, Today morning, somebody was saying, "Wo ek so teen saal ki dadi ko dekke log bahut inspire hote hain." Hmm. So I said, "Yeah, I would have been uh, dadi if my son was, you know, fine and you no, know, because he's 35 now." Hmm. So uh, I said, "These are the examples which inspire us, and they they create human possibilities." We, my my vision is to create human possibilities and tell people that yes, this is possible. Somebody who has a doubt can look up to me. You know, you know, from any perspective, whether it's family or child or physical activity or studies, I did. I restarted my education in 2008 and I did it all over again. Uh, I'm still studying. So, you know, when you can just do anything at any age, any activity. So anybody who is stuck anywhere in life can just look upon me and say, OK, it is humanly possible. I will do it. So that is my desire that I should be able to give that strength to especially the women. Mm. Great. So I have one last question. Mm -hmm. um, imagine you are standing on a stadium and this is the largest stadium that has ever been built in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. There are millions of people mm -hmm. and they are eagerly and passionately waiting to listen to the most important lesson that you have learned in the life. And you haven't given only one minute of time to share the mm -hmm. most important lesson that you've learned. What would be your message? I think we should accept and trust our destiny. Uh, we must have a parallel sense of surrender. Keep doing your best and uh, know that everything will end one day. That should not weaken you, but give you strength. We must believe that we must do whatever we can to add to the collective consciousness. And uh, just be happy always, no matter what happens. 
Dr. Rita, See, we yes. Are, we are, uh, we are, this, uh, our life is the journey of our soul. Many times when I have gone to, say, a Bharatnatyam class where I have not been able to perform or be as uh, punctual, you know, as consistent sometimes, I feel that I will not compare myself to the pros out there. This is my journey. I'm not going to give up in between, no matter how much humiliation I go through, how bad I am. That should not deter me. I can be the worst student in the class, but I will keep going. People who are better than me will come and go. So because I feel it's it's not music, I'm not going to become Lata Mangeshkar and I'm not going to become Yamini Krishnamurti. But everything that I'm doing is sparking a lot of realizations within my soul that the quest to learn, the quest of going through the pain and understanding how every emotion is and how profound it is to go through the process of learning and learning and how everybody feels, I think that evolves our soul. You know, even physical activity has an intellect. And we must just look at life and this is the story of my soul. I am watching this story. So I am watching my story my story is meant to create a legacy and uh, my body is an instrument and I must serve this body so that I can fulfill this journey and leave my message in this world. So when you have that detachment that there's something, somebody else within you, uh, you know, and this will end one day, I think it will just keep you very happy, at peace and strong. And also that calmness and peace is actually uh, the the representation of strength. Hmm. It's how much you can take, not how much you can hit. It's how much you can endure because that will teach you uh, not to hurt others. Hmm. So I think this is the essence of my life. Dr. Rita Jairath, you have had an incredible, um, you know, life and journey and... Uh, Thank you so much. I would like to take this moment to acknowledge for everything that you have done uh, to inspire people, to tell all of us that, hey, life may throw challenges at you, but it's up to you. What do you want to make out of it? And uh, teaching us the lesson on patience, whether that's enduring, uh, you know, the 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 difficult childhood or whether that's enduring uh, and going through this journey with your son or whether going through the you know marriage which was not or maybe far from perfect um, thank you so much for showing us that you can life may throw whatever but you can make your own carve your own path and then still um, you know rise and be an inspiration to so many people out there thank you so much really appreciate it and i feel honored to be having this conversation with you and by far this is probably one of the most inspiring conversations that i've had on the inspiring talk thank you so much and you know i have given so many interviews so i have never spoken out my heart uh, like this thank you for bringing out this in me and uh, I mean, like, it's been very, very uh, gratifying. I think I this will be a record for me also because I am able to express what is within me and it has not been superficial by any means. Uh, so thank you for having me and thank you for asking me all these questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Please, it's all mine. Yeah.